Amen. Praise God. Well, let's be seated this time. A um, question that was asked a couple of weeks back was, when does God answer my prayer? When will he answer my prayer? Is it going to be when we actually experience the manifestation of what we're asking in our prayers? Or is it when you pray your prayer in faith according to the promise? Is that the time frame? Because we live in time, God does not, and that's a theological thing. But it's a real thing when it takes time in our world for the answers to come through. And so... Um, um, I think the scripture here in Mark 11 will help. Mark 11, 23 and 24. Um, Jesus, it's in the context of speaking and prayer and, and so on. He's teaching his, his disciples and he says this, For assuredly I say to you. And he starts off by saying for assuredly because he's going to say something very powerful here. Whoever says to this mountain, and some of us feel like we're in a, a wine press at the moment where we're getting squeezed very tightly. And so what's going to come out of our mouth at that particular point is going to be important. And if something wrong has come out of your mouth, well then just quickly repent and then move on and get to say what God has to say about the situation. But we have mountains, we feel like we're in a wine press, whatever imagery works for you. We're supposed to speak to the mountain, not about the mountain. And so be removed, this is what we're supposed to say, be removed and cast into the sea. And if we don't doubt in our hearts, because our minds can go tilt at this point, but believe those things that we say, remember we have to express it, that's the unique gift that we have as humans is, is speech, will be done. He will have whatever he says, says us three times in this verse. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, now this is where the prayer thing comes in, when you pray, the time frame, when you pray, when you pray, not when you get the answer, but when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So either God is going to honor his word or he's not. Um, that's from his side because, you know, we could, we could spend a whole session on prayer and we have before in the, our series on prayer that I've done. Or we could just take a few moments and look at this. The manifestation of what you trust in God for will come when it's based on His promise. And if we know that promise that applies and believe it, and I'm not saying that our relationship with Him in prayer is a matter of technique and if we can get all the, t the T's crossed and the I's dotted in perfect order, then and then only God will answer prayer. Uh, he's not like that. But He's also not loose and out there that if you throw anything up in the air and it comes down, then that's going to be the answer. So He wants us to know His person. He wants us to know His character. He wants us to know His promises and pray that to Him. In an expectation when we pray that we have the answer then that what that does is it sets us free from that point on to not stress and live in that iffy zone of am I going to have this or am I not a, a, a zone of a, a lack of confidence you could almost say and so the next scripture here first John chapter 5 verse 14 and 15 says now this is the confidence that we have in him and he wants us to be confident in our relationship with him that if we ask anything according to his will which is his word he hears us so when you prayed that prayer a month ago a year ago 10 years ago God heard you God heard you and he's not withholding any good thing from those who walk uprightly before him and seek him and so on and stay in touch and connected and then in verse 15 more powerful stuff and if we know that he hears us whatever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him that the manifestation is on the way and we have a friend well we had a friend um i mean he's still a friend but he um we, we're not we're not engaged with them but back then they had a little kid and we were taught this principle at Bible school and the little kid had a headache the one day. And um, so the kid 
went to daddy and mommy and said, would you pray for me? I've got this headache. And so um, mommy and daddy prayed for little Johnny. What was his name again? Peter. Little Peter, sorry, little Peter. And little Peter went away and then about five minutes later, um, he said, um, mommy and daddy, when's my headache gonna go? You know, the gap, the time frame thing between the prayer that's been prayed and then the actual manifestation. So the parents said, well, you know, the manifestation is on its way. It's, you're going to get a manifestation of your healing in a moment. And so um, he went away again. And then five minutes later, he came back and he said, Mommy and Daddy, when is the man from the station coming? <laughs> and that was his little story. But, you know, our theme, if we ha take a look at our theme and, and session for today, All the Help That You Need, Part 3, The Spirit of Grace. Thank God we don't have to be like this woman on the left-hand side of the picture, burdened by the pressures of life, so much so that we bent over in our, in our bodies even, in our, in, our, in our souls, in our thinking. We're bent over carrying a heavy burden in life. We can actually st stand up right and enjoy the help of the Holy Spirit. And you see our text scripture, John 16, 7, and nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And we know from the Bible that he has come. We know from experience. We know from the manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives today and in people around us that he has come, and he's here to help. He's not going to do it for us necessarily, everything. So we just sit down, fold our arms, put our feet up, start sipping on our enchilada. What's it? Tequila? What's it? You know? Pina, Pina colada? It's not enchilada. I know it's not enchilada. <laughs> you can't sip on an enchilada unless it's been pureed in a mixer. Anyway, let's move right along here. It's the spirit that we want to talk about, the spirit who helps us, the spirit of grace, as you can see from the title there. So what, what is it about the grace approach that is important that I want to share with you to start with? The Holy Spirit is known by many names and descriptions of who, what he's like. He's described as the helper. He's described as the comforter. So if you need some help, Ask for help from the Holy Spirit. If you feel like you need comfort, you just need comfort, don't go to that fluffy thing on your couch and hold it and suck on the end of it like Greg tends to do, right, Greg? He's starting to smile and laugh. and He, he knows what I'm talking about. You grab that comforter, oh, and then you switch on Fox News or CNN and everything. That's not going to bring you any comfort, folk. That's broadcasting on a frequency which is warped and weird. Don't switch that stuff on except to just to get a headline and then move on. Because that's not real news. That's news that has been doctored, filtered, is given in such a way that promotes a particular agenda. Can I have an amen? amen. Some people call it... Fake news. Say it louder. I never said it. I'm a preacher. I'm supposed to stay partial here, impartial here. Anyway, you said it. You, it's you. Anyway, helper, comforter, teacher, advocate, guide, strengthener. And then this last one here that I want to, I want to focus on today is the spirit of grace. And we pick this up from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I don't have time. I'm not going to tell the whole story here from the, from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. But look, look at this prophecy of the description of what's going to be poured out on the day of Pentecost, and which has happened to the people there, of, to David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and by extension, anyone else who wants to get in on what God's doing. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. Wow. Why would God choose grace as opposed to any other word, like law, for example? It's the spirit of grace and supplication that is poured out on us at this time. So what then is the heart of grace? It behooves us to understand a little bit about grace. And I say here in, in terms of a definition that grace is God's unmerited favor. Everybody say unmerited. You can't do anything to merit it. You can't even arrive early for church and clean the bathrooms. Although that helps. <laughs> but you're not going to earn brownie points with God. You'll earn brownie points with me, with your husband, your wife. It's a good thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
But grace is unmerited. Unmerited. It's not something that you earn. It's his favor, his kindness towards us as his gift. Wow, isn't that amazing? His gift. A gift is given on the basis of the giver's heart, not on the basis of the person tidying up their room. You know, like a little kid, like uh, the relationship that we have with our pooch, and maybe you do with your, your animals and everything, is, is, is a, um, a works-based relationship. If you come here, I will give you a little treat. If you sit and give me your paw, I will give you another treat. If you lie down and roll over, I'll give you another treat. You see, and so he comes, not out of a genuine sacrificial love for this human being, but because he's driven by instinct and food and rewards, you know. He's after the rewards, gimme, 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 my name is not Rex, but Jimmy, you know. Anyway, and the thing about grace now, back to grace, the heart of grace, is that Grace, yes, it, it produces an empowerment, as you see in the notes there, to be all that you can be in Christ. It empowers you. When, you. when you have a sense that God's favor is upon you, God's kindness has been given to you in Christ freely, then it, it empowers you to put your shoulders back and march into the rest of your life with some measure of confidence. Can I have an amen? Yeah. It's a fruit of your favored position in Him, on the basis of what he's done. We're in Christ. We're in our Father's house. We can then boldly, not with arrogance, say, yes, I am in my Father's house. Yes, I am who you say I am. It's not prideful. And it's not, if we, if we switch, it, switch it around, uh, humility is not keeping quiet about what God says about you. True humility is, is agreeing with God, with praise, with thanksgiving, with respect, with the fear of the Lord, all of those elements there wrapped up in, in, in the relationship, is acknowledging that you are who God made you to be. That's true humility. False Christian humility is saying, you know, I'm just a worm, I'm just the dust of the earth, and, and if I can just have a little cabin in glory and a little place and a little spot on the planet and everything, and God, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, but, 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 and you get down real low. Humility means to get low, but low things capture things. So if you take a pot and you put it down low and then you pour something from above on top of it, the pot can receive it. But if the pot stands up and turns around and gets above the thing that's pouring it, then it's not going to receive anything. So that part of humility is, is understandable. So really, in the end, um, the heart of grace is not on what we have to do yet to earn God's favor. And, you know, you have, to, you have to listen carefully to the teachings that perhaps you listen on podcast or go on TV and watch or, or anything, something that you might even read in a Christian magazine, to, to, to cut through the fluff and see whether the foundation, the essence, the heart of it is God's gracious, unmerited gift aggressing towards you or... Does it involve a, a long series of steps? A, as you can see there, B, C, etc., etc. All the things that you have to do in order to twist God's arm in some way that he doesn't even notice it, and then his favor drops out of his hand into your lap. No, it's not that. Romans 11.36 puts it this way. For of him and through him and to him are all things, all things, including our walk with him. It's of him. Our walk is, is found in his heart, how, how we live our Christian lives. It's through him with the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of all of that is not self-aggrandizement. It's to glorify him. It's to him. Of him, through him, to him. Very powerful. So, moving here to the point about Jesus and grace, in John chapter 1, verses 16 and 18, and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. So the context is talking about grace here and Jesus. For the law was given, see that word that's highlighted there, through Moses, but grace and truth set in opposition to the law, 
came through Jesus Christ. Now, we know he fulfilled the law, and we're not going to get all technical about the theology of it. But a point is being made here that the law was given. Moses had these tablets. He came down. They were two panados or aspirins, I think it was, tablets, little tablets, you know, take your two tablets. Just kidding. Anyway, the tablets of stone, he came down, he got angry, he broke them, he went up for another 40 days. That's 80 days. Boy, when he came back, he was so skinny, he could walk through the crack in the door, you know, that, that's closed. 80 days. He came back the second time with tablets of stone, and then they had to put that in the mercy seat in the tabernacle on the Ark of the Covenant that was then, then created. Thank God that they did put it in, you know, under the mercy seat because otherwise there would still be thunder and lightning going everywhere and we'd all be toast, you know. But um, the point of it is that the law was given through Moses. It's kind of cold and distant like the stone given. But grace and truth came and dwelt amongst us. There's an intimacy. There's a personableness about Jesus Christ coming and, and, and being with us. And then sending the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of us is just amazing. No one, and then it goes on to say this incredible thing here, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Everybody say with me, He, Jesus, he Jesus. has perfectly declared God. Has perfectly declared God. Okay, now having said that, I'm going to rattle your cage a little bit this morning, so turn to someone next to you. Come on now, or in front of you, or behind you, and say, he's about to rattle your cage. I'm okay, but your cage needs to be rattled. No, I'm just kidding. Right? I'm just not going to be bad. Some people, their favorite Bible character is Job. They're always talking about the book of Job. Or they say that, oh, David, David, King David, or Moses. Right? And so they come up, or Ruth, or... Naomi or Anna or, you know, whoever it is, all of those people have not seen God face to face. They've had visions. They've been caught up into his presence, but they haven't seen him face to face. The only one who has is Jesus. And we know that Jesus is God in the flesh and still is in the flesh. And so technically all of that stuff, right? Just lay that down. He who has truly seen God, the only begotten Son, He has declared Him. So, to me, that sounds like if we're going to understand our Bibles, understand the Spirit of grace operating in all of those characters, from Job, from Moses, to Zechariah, to Isaiah, to John the Baptist, to Paul, to Peter, to Stephen, to Philip, to anybody, we have to filter it through a revelation of the person, the nature, the work, the wonderful majesty of the one who has perfectly declared him, Jesus Christ. Because he's the one who is full of grace and truth and has come. And has come. So what I want to do in, in a week or two, perhaps next week depending, um, is, to, is to start off on, on, a, on a series on the life the times, the ministry, the miracles of Jesus. So we can have that as a, a solid um, uh, filter through which we can understand everything else and walk in it. Because it's not really a matter of mental understanding. And I know you sitting here in the format that we have is I mostly talk and you listen. Some of your minds have wandered already. Would you per, per, per chance care to share where your mind has gone in the last few minutes? No, 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 we won't ask you to do that. But model yourself on the Master Jesus. Let's move right along here. Anyone in need here this morning? Obviously, we know each other fairly well, and so there are pressures, there are needs here in any area. There's no area off limits to God's help in this whole thing. So what are we to do about it? Let us therefore, according to Hebrews 4.16, come boldly to the throne of grace. The throne of grace. Perfectly revealed the mercy, the grace, the, the love, the, the caring, the kindness of Jesus. The throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So it's obviously not going to just drop off on us by virtue of us getting up in the morning on a Monday. 
and walking out the rest of our week. We have to come to the throne room of grace boldly, not so to speak, with our cap in hand and say, oh God, you know, if you're not too busy this week, I really need some help with this matter. No, he, he's, he's, he's able. He's, he's able. And just by the way, why is the therefore, therefore, because it starts off the sentence saying, let us therefore come boldly. The therefore is therefore because of the context of what happened beforehand. And what happened beforehand is a description of how Jesus, as our high priest, because Hebrews talks a lot about priesthood and drawing near to God and not talking to him from a distance and staying away because we're fearful of him in that way. No, we can come up close, up close through, through the blood of Jesus and find that help, that, that, that personal touch of the help where God knows you, He knows your body, He knows your circumstances, He knows your ins and outs of the way you think and everything. He knows how to make a way in the wilderness, make a stream in the desert that we talked about last week there. And so Jesus is our high priest that sympathizes us with us, knowing what it's like to be tempted. He was tempted in His humanity just like we were. And so he knows when you feel at your wit's end. He knows when you get all emotional. He knows all. He knows, he knows the, the frustrations, the shame, the guilt, the every aspect, every spectrum of your emotions, good, bad, ugly, and everything in between. He knows it. He knows it. He's experienced those things. Yet without sin in his case. But he identifies with us. He came. He didn't just lean over the balconies of heaven and say, Here, hey guys, here's, here's, a, here's a couple of things that will help you. Some, some, some fairy dust or heavenly dust, you know, mercy dust. Poof! Comes floating down onto us. No, he came. He got his hands dirty. He touched the lepers. He wept. He got in there with the people that were frust frightened and frustrated. Big tough fishermen and so on. Look at this beautiful scripture here in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able, he's able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. I think he's making a point here. He's got us covered in every area. There's not some little secret corner over here where you and I have to grapple with this because this is our cross, this is our burden, this is what we're supposed to take care of. No, bring everything to the throne room of grace. Bring everything, big, small, in between, because He's able and He's willing to help us. And by the way, you and I are important to Him. You know, obviously, we live in a culture and a society where if you've got so many likes and you've got so many followers on Facebook and Twitter and everything like that, how many of you know that there's a new um, social media interface coming out? You've heard of it. It's called, it's a mixture between YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. It's you twit face. It's called you twit face. Anyway, just kidding. <laughs> I'm talking about the people who didn't come this morning. <clears throat> not you, of course. Not you. I would not insult you. Please, please, please forgive me if you think I am. Anyway, you are important. And it's not a kind of conceited importance where, you know, you just put your chest out and you puff yourself and you walk down the street and you think, I'm important here in Woodenville. Or I'm important here in Washington. Or I'm important here in the United States. Man, just get up in an airplane sometime. And when you get up there, look out the window, and if you're not at a window seat, just kind of lean over and see what you can see, or get up even, and look out there and see how many houses there are out there. How many streets, how many aspects of the city that you and I have never, ever been to. All of those people don't even know who you are. Don't even know that you're on the airplane. Don't even know what you had for coffee, you know, you know what kind of coffee you had at, at the airport. You know? It's not that kind of conceited importance, self-importance, but a God importance. So much so that preachers preach like this. They say, if you were the only person on the planet, Jesus would still have gone to the cross. I don't know who he would have got to nail him to the cross because there wouldn't have been Romans. There wouldn't have been Pilate. You know? But anyway, the theory is there that if you were the only person on the planet, Jesus would still have come 
because that's how important you are to God. It's a good preach point, but, but um, it's nevertheless true that you, are, you and I are important. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through to 10. And this is, the, this is where the importance is underscored. It says here, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Why would God want to save you if you're not important to him? And that not of yourselves, it's a gift to God. Why would he bother to give you a gift if it's just for show? Who is he showing off to? The angels that he's going to give you the, the greatest gift that you could ever get? Never mind the iPhone 10 or XS or anything. The greatest gift that you and I already have in our pockets, so to speak, our spiritual pockets, is salvation. It's the greatest gift. It's a great, you've got what it takes for eternity. You have eternal life. I think that's, that's good news, or have you all gone to sleep with your eyes closed? Not of works, lest anyone be bo should boast. Not our own efforts. For we are his workmanship. Now get this. Get, start to feel the heart of God here. Do you know what the Greek word for workmanship is? Does anyone know? Put your hand up. It's poema. P-O-E-I-M-A. And that's where we get our word po, poem from. And a poem, especially in more classical poetry, is, is something that is worked. It has a structure to it. It is created. It's not just some, some goofy postmodern you know, approach to poetry. It's, it, it's a work of art, you could say. Poetry. Do you have any, does anyone have any favorite poets? Who, who's, who was your favorite poet back in the day? Or whatever that? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. The Psalms. The Psalms are obviously poetry. Anything else? Anyone else? Becky? I can say David. David and the Psalms. I like Hickory Dickory Dock. <laughs> the, the Klaus, you know, the, 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 the mouse ran up the clock. I mean, that's the level of my... I got an English sub-major at university, but that's about as much as I knew. I just got to fake it through university. You know? But seriously, we are God's workmanship. He's been working on you and I, chiseling away at certain things that obviously don't look like Christ because, you know, we, we, we just portray the image of Christ. And, and he's created us. Now, this is the importance thing. He's created us for good works. For good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, a lot of people understand that we're saved from all the bad stuff in life, but they don't always get the unto. We're saved unto something significant, something important. You say, well, I'm never going to be like Billy Graham, or I'm never going to be like Chris Tomlin, or I'm never going to be like Christine Kane, or you know, an evangelist woman, or who, Joyce Myers, or who else can we think of, ladies? Catherine Kuhlman, anybody, you know, just... Pick, pick a hero, a heroine or a hero. No, that's not the point because we're not supposed to compare one another with one another. We're supposed to focus in, look in on God's face and say, what have you shaped me for? What is my unique set, my gifting, my spiritual gifts, my heart, my abilities, my personality, my experiences that I've gone through? What is it that has brought me to this point and what have you got from me the ball to roll a little bit further down the road here. Yeah, what, what do you want me to do and how do you want me to do it? It's, you are important. Say, I'm important. Come on, let's do this. I'm important in God. Not that conceited kind, but the real kind. Look at Second Timothy as, a, as, as a, verse 9 as a supporting scripture. God, who's, who's the subject of the rest of this verse, who has saved us, that's the one side of things, and called us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So our lives are not an accident, product of our parents, whatever. Our lives are not an accident. God has purposed and planned your calling, your experience, your life to go way beyond the struggles that we're having and the, 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 the issues that we're facing at this time. 
Many of us know we're saved, but we haven't yet always explored all the different aspects of a calling. And I'm not going to get into it right now, but there are many more things besides pastors and teachers and, and, uh, and, and evangelists and everything in your calling. Um, you know, I've, I'm just not going to go down that road at this particular point, but there's so much more for us to enjoy. We've been saved from unto something over here. And so our victorious Christian living, if we can move right along here, involves not a matter of doing so much, but a matter of receiving, receiving. Romans 5.17 puts it this way, the victorious side of Christian living. For if by, one man's, by the one man's offense, he's talking about Adam there, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive, and there's the key word there, abundance of grace, receive, abundance of grace, it's a gift, abundance of grace, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. They'll be victorious through the one Christ Jesus. So victorious Christian living is not a matter of trying to come to grips with all of the different things that we have to do. It's a matter of believing and receiving what God has provided for us. So when we sing songs like Only Believe, and you Christians, are oh, you just believers, you're not out there doing social justice stuff and everything, you're not, you're not impacting society. How can you properly impact society? How can you properly declare Christ into a community? Not some watered-down version of Christ, but the true living, eternal Christ that goes way beyond what Portland thinks at this moment, way beyond what they, the midterm elections are brought out in terms of gun control and this and that and tax and carbon, this and, you know, all of the stuff that's going on in our in our community um, the eternal Christ that works in all communities at all times how are you going to accurately reflect him if you haven't received the fullness of his grace and his truth and the abundance of it into your own life and then 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 live it out in the community in a Christ-like way which is eternal it's not just cultural and it's not just fleeting and passing for the moment he's working in us an eternal weight of glory A weight, a substance, that your life has substance, that has weight. You're not just a, a fluff. You're not, you're not just a bump on a log. You are important to God, and you're important to your family, and you're important to the community, and you make a difference by how you act, how you react, how you speak, and how you don't speak, and how you filter things. It's all important. It's, it's, it's not a matter of coming here at, you know, at a certain time on a Sunday morning and doing our Christian thing then going back and then just floating along and holding on in the white knuckle club. I call it you know, the white knuckle club where you're just holding on you know, for another week. And if I can just make it back to church another week, then I think I'll be okay. Um, no, no. Our lives, Jesus has come to give us life and that more abundantly. That people can come and pluck the fruit of our lives and, and, and drink, uh, you know, of, of, of the, the pearls of wisdom that come from your lips. Amen. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Man, natural fruit. So just to kind of um, wrap things up here, what's the difference then between a works program and Christian disciplines? Like Bible reading, prayer, worship, church attendance, giving. Also, all of those things. What's the difference between a works program and those things that we do as Christians and should do, might I add? Well, the answer is faith. Faith in Jesus' completed work. Not faith in those things. It's not a matter of like having faith in your faith and having faith in your Bible reading. No, faith is always focused in a person. Have faith in in God, Mark eleven twenty two, Have faith in God. It's a personal connection. And when you do, God says, Aha! You got it. We're connected. I'm pleased with this thing. I'm not pleased with you generating sweat. I'm not pleased with you picking up a heavy burden. And carrying it and looking over your shoulder and saying, God, are you watching? You know how much I'm sacrificing for you? I'm obedient. I'm reading my Bible. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm here in church. What more do you want? I even sang a little bit. And I prayed a prayer last Thursday. 
<laughs> you know, and God says, whoopee do. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. All that other stuff doesn't please him. He's not into a religious set of do's and don'ts. He's into relationship and fruit from that relationship. A wonderful blossoming fruit from it. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I pray, Lord, I pray that, that as folk seek you this week in those cha areas of challenge, that they seek you according to the word that you've given us today, the spirit of grace helping us feed and drink and be sustained by your free, unmerited favor in our lives. Lord, we don't deserve it, but we're asking for mercy where we've messed up, made mistakes, gone off on a tangent, caught a speed wobble here and there. We thank you that that mercy is freely available. But Lord, we need that grace, that favor, that kindness that you just give to us because of the relationship that we have with Jesus. There's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no regret. There's no angst. We can take a deep breath and relax into your arms. And we do so right now, thinking of the communion, thinking that we live our lives from a position of victory, the victory that you achieved by your death on the cross, that your gracious plan, as we see in the communion um, elements, if we look at the uh, final takeaway here, that his death on the cross, Jesus, facilitated, it opened the door. The door is open to God's plan for the whole man. Our physical bodies, our inner man, in sync, in harmony. Our souls prospering so that we can be in health, not strive and work hard to get to a place of health, but we can be in the realm of health that is there where your presence is. And so, Lord, my prayer this morning is that because and as, as, as we are in your presence, by faith, that we're in a sickness-free zone, we're in a distress-free zone, and we can relax and receive whatever it is that we have need of. For you are all that we need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Feel free to partake of the communion elements as the song about grace plays as a remembrance for what Jesus has already done. Thank you, Lord. Feel free. Past, but only found love. 